Good evening, everyone. Tonight is the town council regular meeting Wednesday, April 21st, 2021 at 7 p.m. via go to teleconference. Uh, at this point, we will have Dennis lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, visible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dennis. You're welcome, sir. On to number two. Are there any visitors on the call that would like to be recognized at this time? Any visitors that would like to be recognized? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from the April 7th and the April 9th, 2021 meetings. Do we have a motion to approve? Mr. So Chairman, I want to change. I change something quickly on that. Any minutes? Yes, uh, that uh, I think it was April the 7th. I gave an overview of the inland wetlands, but at the minutes it says planning and zoning. So it's probably a very minor, but can I make that? Can I make that change? Sure can. All right. So then we look for an approval of the minutes um, subject to a change uh, as presented by Eric. So moved. Second. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Uh, appointments, reappointments. We do not have anything on the agenda for tonight's meeting. We will move on to number five, which is the approval of appropriation from the Board of Education non lapsing account. Um, everybody's received the authorization to request. Um, Access to the non lapsing account funds, which was discussed at our prior town council meeting on 3 2 21. Uh, this obviously is giving them access to those funds. Uh, before we go on with this, are there any questions on this at this point? Yeah, I just have one, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Dennis here. Uh, I see where they've uh, taken one off, and it says hold for potential for grant funding. Can I get a little clarification on that from Carl, please? Mm -hmm. I think there's a review going on right now as to whether some of this uh, federal money, which will be going directly to schools, whether that's an eligible project under SR2 or SR3 funding. Um, so I know they're reviewing that process now to see if it's a, a way they want to spend uh, some of those federal funds. So there's reviewing that first before looking to use the non-lapsing account. Okay, I'll just further comment and say then, well, once we pass this, this is it for this year. So if in fact later they find out they cannot uh, use this money for that purpose, then they'll have to wait till next year for this project. Is that correct? No, it's a non-lapsing account. So the monies will still be available to them. So this, these funds will live fiscal year to fiscal year until the fund is completed. Okay, fine, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, here and then I work for a motion for authorization to request the access to the non-lapsing account funds as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Tim. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to number line item number six, which is permission to apply for a grant to replace the fire rescue boat. Um, anybody have any questions in reference to this before we go into it? Christine Goofield, sorry, I wasn't able to hear anybody before. I just logged back on. What was um, what are we referring to right now? I missed the agenda item. Uh, agenda item number six: permission to apply for a grant to replace the fire rescue boat. Was um was Mary sharing in the thing that was emailed, or what are we looking at? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I have a prepared statement for you. I just didn't get a chance to email to Mary. It's the same as last year. Okay. All right. Then you want to present, please? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, uh, members. 
Council. Uh, the request is to apply for the port security grant for the replacement of the fire department marine fire rescue vessel. Uh, we're seeking approval tonight from the town council and the town manager to submit a grant for the replacement of the fire rescue boat. Uh, approval of this grant application uh, requires a 25% uh of the grant amount in our if our application is selected for award the grant funding requested in the application is the amount of five hundred thousand. so the town's contribution at that point if this was awarded would be one hundred and twenty-five thousand. uh the program we're applying for is one of four grant programs offered by the department of homeland security and it's funded through fema through the post 9 11 act uh, the current funding level for this uh, program is $100 million. Our application deadline is May 14th, 2021, with anticipated award announcements uh, on or around July 16th, 2021, making that funding available on or around September 30th, 2021. Just a quick background, our existing vessel uh, was placed into service in 2002, which replaced the 1986 vessel. Uh, it serves us well for many years. Uh, <clears throat> it's currently been replaced uh, or repainted. We replaced the motors one time during its service time. Uh, the current vessel is uh, reaching nearly 20 years old and is listed in the capital replacement plan uh, for roughly 2023 for an amount around 600000 Uh Applying for this grant now and hopefully potentially uh, being awarded the grant will alleviate a large burden on this plan uh, in the coming years. The Marine community in Clinton uh, has changed drastically over the last 20 years, and uh, the scope and our to protect the shoreline's critical infrastructure is the main goal of this project. Uh, we have been very fortunate that we have not had significant fire events along our shoreline or on our uh, main uh, fire target hazard on, in the Marine area, uh, Sear Island, which has uh, 53 seasonal homes with little to no robust fire protection, which is uh, currently being addressed. Uh, this doesn't take into account the uh, millions of dollars of vessels that are currently docked at our marinas annually. Our current vessel does have very limited firefighting capabilities. So in the event of a major incident uh, or fire near the shoreline, we would rely heavily on marine assets from other surrounding communities, which could result in a significant delay for our operation. Uh, we have again sought uh, grant writing assistance of a local taxpayer who has written successful applications for marine assets for both the town of Exus and the town of Guilford Fire Departments. Uh, as we stand now, we're in the process of obtaining letters of support from the local marinas and owner operators and from the beach community associations. We would also ask uh, for a letter of support from the town council, and we've been reaching out to our state elected officials. There is some uh, potential to utilize funding, uh, should this be awarded by uh, the sale of the existing vessel for the town's portion of the funding. And uh, we will definitely explore those options as things get closer. Uh, the timelines do kind of fall into some of the funding discussions that I've had with uh, Carl in regards to the apparatus replacement fund and the potential uh, for the replacement of the tanker. So really dependent on the grant award is what direction uh, we'll be taking that budget line item. Questions? Anybody have questions? Brian, what's the amount the town would be responsible for again? I'm sorry. Uh, so the the finute number we rounded off to five hundred thousand because we were within like uh, eleven hundred bucks. So the town's portion of that would be twenty five percent, which is one hundred twenty five thousand, if my math serves me correctly. Okay, and you said we'd find out about whether or not we we got the this grant when 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 uh after july 1st so uh as i talked about with carl uh, we do have uh, an apparatus uh, reserve fund established and we can potentially utilize the funds uh from the sale of the existing vessel to offset some of those costs as well so the burden would hopefully be very minute thank you brian 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 the when you say the burden would be minute, where would the, I mean, I presume the boat isn't worth much. You're not going to get a lot of money for that. Um, where do you think the, the, I mean, are you anticipating that the town is going to be able to 
uh, contribute $100,000 plus or minus towards this right off the bat? I mean, at the absolute most, uh, there is that amount that exists uh, in the current apparatus reserve fund. So, But isn't that earmarked for future uh, heavy equipment? I mean, trucks, et cetera. It is, got the, boat is also, the boat is also included in that plan. So we would have to potentially amend the plan uh, once we knew what the exact contribution would be and what the, uh, I can't comment exactly on what the, the value of the existing vessel was because we were given uh, a number verbally and nothing in writing. So I don't want to go on the record with that at this point. Right, right. And no, that, I get that, that. Was also, that was at the well, time. Right. When, uh, go ahead. Um, I have another question. I know that um, um, emergency medical services has been huge in, you know, providing ambulances and, and taking care of a lot of uh, the lion's share of their own um, expenses for equipment going forward. Would the fire department itself have anything to contribute to this um, balance? I could certainly uh, bring that back to the department and uh, before if, in the anticipation if the grant uh, was supported for us and potentially awarded uh, before we accepted that award, I think we can nail down exactly where that 25% contribution is going to come from. Okay. Ryan, this All right. Uh, does this grant is this just available for this year or is this a grant that comes up periodically uh it is it is offered once a year so we applied for it last year and connecticut overall uh did not fare very well surprisingly we had a change in leadership from the captain of the port so uh i think connecticut overall only received about 1.5 million out of that 100 million which is very unusual Okay, so you think there's a, a good chance this year that that number is going to be significantly higher and our chances would be better to be that, able to get the grant? That is, right, that is the hope. Uh, in sitting in on the, uh, the conference calls for this grant in particular and through our uh, Marine Group meetings, there, there, there is support for uh, replacement vessels this year. There's a lot of the focus outside of uh, cybersecurity is to kind of bolster the uh, the manufacturing economy. Thank you. Dennis, did you have a question? Yeah, just uh, one thing. Um, if we were to approve this, uh, this grant, then we would not be subject if, uh, or held to uh, go forward with the purchase of the boat if the grant is not approved. I mean, we wouldn't be on the hook for the whole $500,000 by any chance, would we? Correct. The absolute maximum that you'd be on the hook for would be 25%. I'm saying, Brian, if in fact we approve this motion, I think we did it last year, by the way. Yes, you did. And grant failed we would not be obligated to still go forward and purchase this boat at $500,000 and the town would be subject to the entire bill. Correct. It was, it is not currently in the replacement plan where it would only come up for replacement at this point in time if the grant was successful. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an excellent opportunity to try and meet our needs at minimal um participation i would make it is it time to make a motion i mean if there's any other questions yeah if anybody else has any other questions if not we can move forward okay sure okay. Go ahead. Well, i would like to make a motion to give the fire department permission to apply for a grant to replace the fire rescue boat second does it need to have more specifics than that i'll i'll do a second so. Does it need more specifics, Mary? Does it have to address a certain um, agency or no? Carl? I, I think you just want to make sure that they're applying for the port security grant. 
Okay. All right. So you could add that in then. Thank you. Okay. And Tim, you okay with that on the second? Yes, I am. Okay. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, members of the council. Have a good night. You too. Now move on to item number seven, which is permission to apply for a state historic document preservation grant. Um, we have the paperwork here in front of us again, in reference to this grant. Uh, before we go forward, does anybody have any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Well, Sharon, you got it easy. Oh, well, Sharon, I do have a question. This is Tim. Uh, I think we've applied for this grant before, right? And has it been used for the electronic uh, uh, data that you're trying to store? Every grant is specific to a project. So this is a new grant with a new project. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, hearing none, we'll look for a motion then for uh, permission to apply for a state historic documents preservation grant. So I'll move. I'll make the mo Second. Have we got that already? Okay. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome, Sharon. All right, we'll move on now to number eight, which is the blight ordinance discussion. We had this on our agenda last time. We spoke about it briefly. Uh, Carl had provided us some information at that point. We now actually have it in writing in front of us. Um, so I just want to open this up for discussion to see um, and feelings from the council members on how we may want to proceed with our updating our current ordinance. Uh, of the thing, of the four items I gave you on the on the matrix, it's really the first one is an ordinance amendment, which is putting a special assessment on a blighted property. That would require a committee to determine the value of the cost to abate uh, a blighted property as well as the enforcement costs. And then if the assessment is not in fact paid, it turns into a lien on the property. Uh, but there's more language that would have to be injected into the town's current ordinance to allow for uh, special assessments. Tax increment financing is a financing tool. Um, you would normally do it within a larger project rather than sort of carving out one individual property. You have to define what the tax increment financing district is. So that's very site specific. Uh, so too is a neighborhood revitalization zone. So some of these tools are more, uh, more commonly used in urban settings where you've got dedicated areas to be able to uh, define as uh, blighted areas that, that need investment or other tools to encourage reuse of the property uh, rather than a one-off property in one individual neighborhood. Uh, Carl, may I ask a question here? Does this require a an appeals board to be set up as well? The, um, the current ordinance has the well, the current ordinance is the board of selectmen, but that would be the board of the, the town council would be functioning as the hearing board, or you'd have to appoint a hearing officer. Uh, previously, uh, Phil Stengel functioned as the hearing officer who would hear complaints for those that were uh, aggrieved or having difficulty coming into compliance when the zoning enforcement officer um, gives them a citation for a failure to comply with cleaning up blight. So you have to have that process if you're going to charge like local citations and generate these kind of liens. Otherwise, it's off the court. So you could have just one individual, not a committee, not a board. Uh, that's your choice. Uh, you have to have a public hearing. You have to have a hearing process. So that's a hearing officer is the, the way the current language reads. Okay. Thank you. Carl, in your report, you included, let me bring it up here, 
some other options, additional authority, you, I think you phrased it as, as NRZs, Neighborhood Revitalization Zones, and Tax Increment Financing. Are these tools that you're familiar with, other communities are using, and should we perhaps look at something like this? So a neighborhood revitalization zone, as I just mentioned, is more of a, an urban tool where you've got a specific area of town. It's not a singular problem property. It would be a large swath of the community um, falling in an NRZ. So that's more of a neighborhood planning process with outreach and the neighborhood association um, leading the charge, working with the town to try and identify uh, ways to improve uh, blighted areas in that neighborhood. Uh, it becomes the town has the ability to use eminent domain to acquire properties. Um, so while an NRZ does have a blight angle, I think at the heart of it, it's supposed to be an economic development tool. And so too would be tax increment financing. You'd have to define a district. Uh, again, not a single one-off property, but an entire section of town that you wanted to have tax increment financing um, be deployed. Uh, again, it's an economic development tool, um, but one of the eligible expenses could be uh, cleaning up blighted property. So that's, you know, it, it, TIF is something that could be done in the downtown area in Clinton. It isn't necessarily something that's done in a residential neighborhood because there's no, there's, there's no tax increment that's generated. Thanks, Carl. Um, Carl, I'm looking at the first option you have listed here, the special assessment on a blighted property. And um, it sounds like it's a council that puts in place um, an assessment on a blighted housing to cover blight enforcement and remediation costs. How uh, does that mean that the town would go in and fix the problem and um charge the cost of that remediation to the homeowner it, it or would, be would there be a, a committee would have to be appointed and the statute lays out who the committee members are and they would have to determine the value of the abatement um, and then they, i'm you, sorry i missed that they would have to determine what of the abatement the value of uh, the value okay. of the assessment so they would determine okay the added uh, assessment that goes on the house to be paid. If the assessment is not paid, it becomes a lien that sits on the property. Um, so it's another way to try and get the responsible so, property owner to take care of their property. So is the assessment pre any remediation? The assessment is just a ballpark figure that the that is assigned to this property or so? I'm really not clear on how it works. I mean, I know I have mentioned, yeah, clearly I'm not. Um, I know I have mentioned this clean and lean um, option before where uh, uh, by ordinance, by the what we refer to as blight ordinance, a property is cited as blight and the town goes in and remediates. And then the cost of that action is applied in a lien. So you have a, a, um, a notification to a homeowner, they have the opportunity to remediate. Then if they don't do that within a time frame, the town does what it says it's gonna do. And then the, um, the assessment is made and attached via a lien. Um, to me, that path seems really clear and um, that you're putting a real, cost of the remediation on the shoulders of the property owner rather than a committee to uh, create an assessment is that is that different from what you have here or am i interpreting this incorrectly so what you're describing is you know it depends on what we're talking about for scale and scope if you're talking about cutting high grass that's certainly something that fits your definition of clean and lean. If we're talking about cleaning up a yard, uh, dealing with a blighted building, uh, larger scale investments of that nature, probably, I'm not sure how much you want to do it from generally from a risk management standpoint, but you certainly don't want to be cleaning up somebody's trash 
without more muscle behind you to make sure that if you throw away something, uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure, and you've got uh, other issues and liabilities that then start to roll out of it. So I guess my question to the council is really, what are we talking about for types of blight? If we're talking about high grass and weeds, that's kind of on the low end of the spectrum. If we're talking about buildings or abandoned properties that have been, uh, somebody's walked away from it or, or something of that nature, it's really kind of, what are we trying to talk about? So there's multiple tools to be used and each tool is gonna to be unique to the fact patterns around the neighborhood, the building, the use, or the, the nature of the blight. So it's just a matter of what what are we what are we trying to um, remedy here? Is it something in a large scale area that defines its own? Is it a one off in a neighborhood? Um, that, that really is kind of the heart of what we're trying to accomplish here. I think a lot of the issues that we have in town are more so blighted properties. I mean, if you get into the cutting the grass and maintaining a property. And then you're charging the borrower to do that, you know, then we're in the business of having a landscaping business where we're cutting logs every week. Because if they're not there, you know, it, it could be done once, but if they don't continue to maintain the property thereafter, then we're into the same kind of trap again with that. So I think we have to weigh that option as well to see kind of like Carl saying, how big do we want this to be? Is it going to be, a, you know, a property where, you know, the property is going into disarray where we, you know, have to do something more so than, you know, the lawn, you know, cutting the grass, picking up trash, mm. doing all that stuff. And that becomes then, you know, you know, DPW then at that point has to be involved in, you know, that that's a whole different ballgame. So I think mm -hmm. it's the, you know, what seems to be kind of the the noise that that exists is that it's the properties themselves, the ones that are falling into disrepair, where, you know, this property needs to be maintained because it, it's becoming a big issue. So, you know, I guess we'll just have to kind of figure out which way we want to head. Um, and I think everybody agrees our blight ordinance needs a little bit more, you know, a little bit more teeth in it, um, more so than anything else just to have people accountable for their properties, you know, because if they know nothing's going to happen, then they'll just, you know, they, they won't take care of it. They won't do anything. Um, you know, if they know that there's a, an ordinance in place that has some, some bite to it and that, you know, we can, you know, kind of push for with something, then I think that helps. Absolutely. Chris, you know, my concern too is people that have, untold number of cars you know mm -hmm. you're supposed to have one unregistered car only right but people have multiple cars yeah. some people i've seen have multiple mowers i mean stacked up mowers everywhere i mean i just how do you handle that how do you say right. you have to remove those mowers you've got to remove those cars and if you don't we're going to remove them and then where right. do we take them I'm, I just, what are we doing? right yeah. I mean, this is like, I mean, this is what the issues I think has always been. And the reason why our ordinance is the way it is, because these topics have never been discussed. And I think it's, you know, now is the time there. Obviously, you can see that a lot of new development, a lot of things going on, and we just need to get a handle on it so that going forward, there will be a process in place that people will understand, they'll know, and they'll have to follow it. Yeah. So, I mean, these are all things that we have to continue to discuss. And I mean, it's, you know, I don't know if it'll be solved tonight. If, you know, we want to take another look at it next week, then, you know, obviously we can do that as well. Uh, it? Yeah, Chairman, for my two cents, uh, quite frankly, I don't know if discussing it at our uh, town council meetings like this, uh, does it make any sense at all to have a special workshop one night and dedicated to this where we can discuss and get all the information and, and, and talk? Uh, and, and, and then come come back with a package that we can then, uh, I guess, discuss in the open open forum to the public and you know get their reaction and all. But I mean, uh, I just think that uh, just I don't know how long we want to spend on this on any one town council meeting, but I think it's going to be a little extensive discussion. 
because as more. I, I agree, Dennis. I think you're absolutely right. This isn't something we can just kind of spitball around. We have to look at what exists and winnow down because, I mean, I'm thinking about the different types of light. We are all pretty familiar with a building right smack dab in the center of town where the grass is mowed and the property is neat, but the building is a total eyesore. It's got, it's got siding falling off. It hasn't been touched for years. And that person has been taken to court with blight complaints repeatedly over the years and just refuses to do anything with it. What do you do with a case like that? That's very different from a foreclosed house with tall grass. I think yeah. that we really do have to sit down and, and talk about all the aspects of this yeah. and, and make some conclusions and bring that back to the town council. And okay. You know, that's my opinion. Yep, I agree. I mean, there is a lot. I mean, there's a lot to digest with all of this because there's not mm -hmm. one simple answer because it brings into a lot of other factors. We might make a decision here, but that also brings involved DPW or, you know, other areas of the town where that's going to be some, you know, costs associated with that as well. So, yeah, yeah, you, it's it's really important to to put teeth into the ordinance because I spoke with Kathy King about the procedure that she uses. She is our blight officer at this point, and she will she receives a complaint. She goes out and investigates and takes photographs, and she has a chart that she lists the violations of on uh, whatever, and uh, that she sends the chart, the photographs, and a letter to the homeowner, to the property owner. And they have 10 days to respond or remediate. If she hasn't seen any change in 10 days or they haven't reached out, then she sends a second letter. And if there is nothing after that, she said the option is to consult with um, Carl or the town manager and see whether it's worth going through a legal process to penalize the owners so at the end of the day you know it's it's a process where if the people wait long enough essentially nothing happens so um i don't know well, what the answer is i think it, uh, it it's, it's time to talk about it right the way the current system is is that's what they do they wait out the process so um we certainly can you know talk mm -hmm. further about it i'll talk to carl after the meeting and see if we can come together with something that we might want to put together uh, as a meeting to discuss it further and just have that be the topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. Everybody good with that? Thank you, Chris. I agree. I would love to hear from Carl's experience in North Brantford and other communities yeah. and, and how uh, you know, Blight worked in, in those places. So yeah, thank you. All right. We will now move on to item number nine, which is authorizing the resolution for the police vehicle lease agreement, which we all have. Wait a minute, well. wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I just say something? Can we, can we, maybe to conclude that discussion set up a committee or a workshop or something uh, yeah, if so people they're interested council members who would like to get together and, and look at i've got the ordinance here it's like five pages long um if anybody wanted, would want to meet and and look at it and and pull it down to the essentials and maybe maybe we could do that at this moment in time put that workshop yeah. sort of thing together yeah, that's what I said. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to Carl. We'll get the paperwork out to everybody on our current ordinance, and then we can put it all out to the council, and then we can decide when you know we'd like to do all this. Excellent. Things. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, authorizing the resolution for the police vehicle lease agreement. Uh, we all have the resolution in front of us. Carl, can you just give us a little background on this whole item? Carl, after all this time. Um, so this is the last lease for police vehicles. Um, it, money was provided in the budget at the start of this fiscal year to lease the vehicles. Uh, we are now at a point where the vehicles are ready to be received and the financing now needs to be wrapped up. Um, so the debt service is provided in the budget. This is the same um, resolution that was acted on last year uh, creating a new arrangement with um, Bank of America to finance the, the vehicle purchase. Okay. Any, anyone have any questions? Okay. Here and then, then we will do the resolution. Whereas, as part of its budget process, the town of Clinton has previously authorized the use of lease 
purchase financing to fund replacement of police department vehicles. And whereas equipment leases were codified in the master equipment lease purchase agreement dated October 3rd, 2016 with Bank of America Public Capital Corp. And whereas the master equipment lease purchase agreement has been amended by adding new schedules of property each time new equipment purchases are financed. And whereas the town desires to finance new police department vehicles, which requires the master equipment lease purchase agreement to be amended to include schedule of property number seven for vehicles to be purchased as part of the town budget for the fiscal year July 1st, 2020 through June 30, 2021. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council of the town of Clinton hereby authorize and direct the town manager to execute on behalf of the town of Clinton the necessary agreements and forms by and between Bank of America Public Capital Corp to lease three police department vehicles for a total of 1498856 as part of the master equipment lease purchase agreement dated as of October 3rd, 2016 and schedule of property number seven. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, very opposed? I think you need somebody to make the motion first. I'm sorry. A motion to approve? So moved. A second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Moving on now to item number 10, which is the line item transfer request, uh, town clerk, police department, and Morgan Bridge repair. We all have copies of the transfer of funds request forms. Um, are there any questions on any of the transfers? No questions? Okay, at this point then we will make a motion for the town of Clinton transfer of funds request for the, which was the first one, town clerk. For one thousand dollars, coming from uh, coming uh, from elections and decrease other items of a thousand dollars. So moved. A second. Further discussion. All in favor. Aye. 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 Abstain. Thank you. Item number two will be the town of Clinton transfer funds request form for the police department. Average for funds removed after audit correction. Coming from vehicle maintenance 13050, uh, going to salaries over time of 13050. Motion to approve. So moved. A second. Second. On favor. I'm sorry, further discussion? Well, I do have further discussion. Yep. I think we're transferring from uh, salaries to vehicle maintenance. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. exactly. Sorry. I think Chris, you said it backwards. So Sorry. I just okay. wanted to clarify Thank you. Uh, what we're voting on. Yep. So that's the motion. The motion will be amended then to come from salaries and overtime for 13050 going to vehicle maintenance for 13050. Okay. So moved. Second. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? And the last transfer funds request would be for DPW uh, additional funding needed for continued repairs of the Morgan School Bridge project damaged by the 2018 flash flood, coming from contingency for 15,000, going to NRCS Indian River Work Recovery 15,000. Motion to approve. So moved. A second. second. Any other further discussion? All in favor? All right. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you all. We'll now move on to the finance director's report, item number 11. Sue. Hi, excuse me. Hi, good evening, everyone. You all have copies of the March report in front of you. I just want to point out a few of the highlights. Uh, March was a pretty quiet month, financial reporting speaking. Revenues of 840,000 uh, were recorded during the month of March. That included 608,000 of tax revenues. Um, and within that tax revenues, 443 of that was for the current tax levy. Um, current tax revenues for the nine months ending March are 99.4% of budget compared to 99.5% the prior year at the same time. 
Other town service revenues continue the strong trend as reported in prior months and a total for the nine months ending exceed the full year fiscal 21 budgeted revenues by 365,000 each a third coming from the police contractual town clerk services and building and land use fees. Building fees alone for the month of March were 56,000, which is more than double the previous month and it's the highest revenue so far recorded this year. Miscellaneous other revenues that we received included 24,000 from Frontier for telephone access lines and $16,000 distribution from the Wasam Trust. State grant revenue um, received during the month was the local capital improvement or LOSIP grant of $84,000 and $20,000 was accrued for anticipated water fund grant proceeds. Expenses for March were 3.4 million. Of that 2.3 of it was the transfers to the Board of Ed. The remaining 1.1 was the average monthly fixed expenses consistent with prior months for the salary and contractual obligations. Department budgets are being reviewed by, by the department managers and any anticipated overruns are being addressed with the line item transfers as you've seen tonight. Um, with the exception of salary related budget shortfalls, which were due to the contract settlements that are going to be covered through contingencies that you're aware. At this time, it's forecast that any other overruns will hopefully be covered by line item transfers within the departments. Other investment balances, um, Unrestricted investment balances is 25.8 million at the end of March, which is a decrease of 2.4 from February. That was 3.4 million of the operating expenses offset by the $1 million in revenues. Contingency remains at 250,000. That was prior to the request tonight to transfer 15 out of that for the Morgan Bridge project. And unrestricted fund balance revenues remain at 19.8% of fiscal 21 budget expenditures. There's no change in that as well. That concludes my report for March. Any questions? Sue, I have two quick questions. You mentioned the LOCIP, this local capital improvement grant. What's the process related to that? And I, I guess at the end of it, you've mentioned the town's wastewater facilities project plan. How does that whole thing work? I'm sorry to be so ignorant about it. No, that's fine. Uh, the low sub grant is a, uh, there's an allocation that the state makes and determines how much we're going to receive during the year. And then during the year, uh, we determine projects that can be applied towards that grant. And so we complete the application based on the definition of the projects within that grant. We apply for it and then they return the funds to us. This year, the project that we applied to that grant was the WASAM Auditorium uh, roof project. The repairs on that qualified, as well as a little bit of the funding over at the Ethel Peters uh, Pavilion Complex. So the, the dollars for that were offset by the grant. The other grant, um, it's the Clean Water Fund that we've been receiving for a number of years, and we're reimbursed 55% of the engineering expenses related to the wastewater treatment project. And that's basically the engineering um, fees that we incur by CDM Smith. And um, that's that piece of it. Okay, and then Sue, the money for use for salaries and payroll coming from the contingency fund, do we have any uh, estimate as to how much that might be? Well, we're fortunate this year to receive the CRF funding. So that helped uh, that $99,000 grant that we received earlier in the year that helped offset some of our cost overruns there. So um, with the forecast that I just provided to Carl yesterday, um, right now I'm thinking we're only going to need about 40 to $48,000 of the contingency to cover the salary line items. Okay, All right. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Sue. You're welcome. All right, now we'll move on to Chairman's report. Um, just a couple quick items. Just wanted to thank again John Harrington, who put together that cleanup uh, over the weekend. Um, obviously, and thank all the volunteers that showed up to help out with that over the weekend on Saturday. Um, and also, there's a Clean Up Clinton group by uh, Liz Smith, um, who's put together and goes out there. Uh, you know, uh, quite often to, to do some pickup around the town. So I just want to acknowledge those 
individuals and all the uh, people that came out to help on Saturday and continue to help on an ongoing basis to make sure we keep our town clean. Um, we'd like to also acknowledge the old pavilion that was over at Ethel's Peter that uh, got lost in our little sinkhole over there um, has now been put back up and um, it's going to be dedicated to Harry Swan, who was uh, is obviously our little league here in town is named after uh, Harry Swan. So uh, that, there's going to be a dedication for that on the 24th, which is Saturday which is opening day of Little League. So just wanted to give an acknowledgement out there. Harry spent years and years and years with Little League, and uh, it's good to see that pavilion back up and then, uh, you know, giving the name to uh, to Harry Swan. Um, and then one last thing, on an ongoing basis, starting with our next meeting, there's going to be a line item that we put on the agenda every week or every meeting, and we want it to be that the, uh, Carol had mentioned this to me, and it's something that I thought was a great idea, where um, open it up for discussion with council members on items that we feel that we should be working with uh, with the town manager. So having open discussions about what we think and where we should be headed with this council so that we have a, a clear function on where we're going. Um, and if there's things that we would like to present to call that we feel um, are important, um, that we bring that to call and we can work together with him on, on making things happen. Um, so there'll be more of an, an ongoing open conversation about things that uh, we might want to work with, we want to work on as a council as a whole. Um, so that'll be happening uh, again, starting next meeting, and we can have those open discussions amongst everybody. All right. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to the town manager's report. Uh, so in the interest of time, I know we've got still more left to go. I'll try and be brief. Um, just want to let you know that uh, our town clerk has completed some of her additional certification training. So she is now a master Connecticut town clerk has received certification to that end uh, earlier this month. Uh, so that's a uh, commitment to her ongoing professional development to do her job and serve the public better. Uh, I think most of you are aware that on Monday evening, the governor laid out what the next phase of Connecticut reopening is going to be. So by May 19th, uh, it looks as if most of the sector rules that have been put in place governing activities in businesses will, um, will, will go on our way. Um, there is, as, as late as this evening, further discussion regarding masking, that there is an expectation that masks will still be required for indoors after uh, from May 20th. Uh, what that legal framework is going to be is not clear at this point. Uh, the governor's staff pointed out that there's a role for the General Assembly to define that. Um, so there's what that's going to look like going forward is, is not clear, but there's an expectation. Additionally, the Department of Public Health is supposed to be putting out guidelines, so the mandates will all go away and be replaced with guidelines. Um, so that starts to impact our operations. Um, First and foremost would be going back to in-person meetings. Unless there's some other action that takes place, the uh, this electronic forum would go away also on May 20th. Board of Ed is preparing to go in-person on May 17th with the, that meeting. Uh, for our groups, uh, I think we would run it out until the evening of the 19th. Uh, which makes, I think, a council meeting night. And then after that, we would shift over to in-person um, with social distancing. Rooms might have to change, so rose room meetings might have to move to green room. Green room meetings might have to move to the auditorium uh, while we try and figure out what guidance comes from, from DPH. Uh, also operationally, there's increased interest in using the auditorium. Uh, so to make the auditorium available, we will have to move forward with hiring a part-time custodian. Uh, that's a position that's been vacant for a while, and we have not filled it because we haven't needed it, uh, given the lower activity in the building. Um, but if we're going to go back to some semblance of normal, uh, we'll have to go through a process to hire a part-time custodian to, uh, to make sure that we can service the building as well as the needs of outside outside users that are chomping at the bit to get in and use the auditorium. Uh, the rest of my report you have in, in writing, uh, that went out 
today. Um, so you, you have you have that information, and the only other the only other things I have for you are executive session materials. So unless there's any questions, thank you, Carl. No questions. All right. No, no, we'll move on to uh, number 14, Town Council Committee Liaison Reports. Anyone? Uh, Tim? Uh, I uh, attended the uh, virtual meeting for EDC, but primarily uh, since John Allen wasn't there for that meeting, it was more a discussion of what was brought forth to the Town Council. So. Everybody's got those minutes, so I'm not going to belabor and go into those. Uh, that it was a, a very short meeting, and uh, that was it. Thank you, Tim. Eric? Yeah, planning and zoning will meet on May the 10th for a public hearing on four amendments to the zoning regulation. Uh, there is, of course, the regional planning and uh, plan of conservation development uh, regional plan on April 26th. I think we've all been invited to that. And Kathy King attended uh, a, a forum, Desegregate Connecticut, which in her own words, she learned um, some of the myths about zoning reform were debunked. And I haven't had a chance to talk to Kathy about that. I was just wondering if perhaps Carl could help us understand what those ramifications might be with zoning reform. And, and maybe Christine could chime in here too. I think Christine currently sits on the what, planning and development. Is there anything that we as a town need to be aware of with these possible zoning reform changes? I would defer to Christine since she's been dealing with it a little bit more intimately than I have. Um, perhaps it's, if it's a topic you want to get into, perhaps at one of the future meetings, we can get into more deeper discussion. Um, there's three major bills currently in front of planning and development still that will be moving to the floor of the House and then on to the Senate. And um, they're still in flux, I would say. So some of the language might be evolving. Um, we're not sure yet where they will ultimately go because they're they're pretty robust in their mandates and they're a little bit complex um so like i said it, perhaps if you want to have a deep dive conversation about it you might want to add it to the agenda at a future date when the uh, language is a little bit more solidified okay and you could at least give us the the bill numbers i'd be i'd be interested in learning about the, the particular bills themselves and where they sit you said they're coming out of committee um, they voted out of committee, so there's quite a number of um, there's quite a number of bills. We've actually moved 65 bills out of committee, which is actually a huge number, and it's very unusual. Um, related to zoning, there's quite a few of them that are related to zoning. I would say there's six of them. Um, two or three of them are substantially related to affordable housing and some zoning changes. One of them, in particular, is related to um, uh, mandating training for land use boards and that was eliminated from one bill and moved out to another so um, again things are a little bit in flux right now so when things solidify a little more it might be um, easier for me to talk about the specifics of the legislation if that would be helpful to everybody thank you anyone else uh just briefly mr chairman last monday uh a week ago Monday, uh, the police commission had their meeting and uh, again, everything is going along according to schedule as far as their budget's concerned. There's no uh, line items of uh, that were in particular or in any problems. I just wanted to mention uh, two nice things. One is the fact that uh, with that community uh, assistance team, project that the police chief and uh the police department has uh undertaken they now have uh approximately 20 volunteers to uh perform those uh tasks and uh the four various areas that they will be uh involved in would be just common companionship if you will if someone just needs someone to come over and talk with them uh transportation 
uh, two and four, I guess, small trips to doctors or something of that nature in the local area. Uh, light yard work and also the same as far as housework. So I think uh, this assistance program is, is going to be quite beneficial, not only to uh, people that are of senior age, but also people that have uh, disabilities or just, you know, are incapable of, uh, or they need a little help. Uh, the second item uh, I'd like to say is that uh, at this particular moment, the police department is really trying to achieve a goal of having a operator for the police boat on every shift. And uh, they probably 90 percent complete on that goal. They're, they're sending officers and what have you, uh, even the shift supervisors and, and the captains are all going to be uh, certified to handle that boat so that at any time that a emergency uh, for police and fire out there, Clinton will be able to respond with the police boat, not having to uh, call in officers uh, from home uh, that are not on duty. So there'll be an officer or someone available to do that. I think that's going to be uh, a very important thing as the summer comes along. And the last thing is, uh, I think I reported last month that, uh, you know, we had a little problem over there at the uh, Meadows Road uh, Tower and with some type of uh, microwave uh, transmission problem that at first looked like it may cost us anywhere in the near, uh, in the neighborhood of about $50,000. But however, the chief uh, said at the, the last meeting that with the, uh, the consultant that we have attached to our radio program thinks that he can get someone in there and get it fixed uh, temporarily uh, at a lot less expense. So that's good news also. So uh, that's my uh, report, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone else? So um, I attended the public works meeting the other night and uh, public works is is doing the best they can with the staffing situation that they have and they are um, it, very encouraged to hear that their uh, personnel issue was was positively voted forward the other day and we're all hoping that it makes it through the budget process. Uh, there was conversation about the bridge repairs that are going on. Apparently, Pleasant Valley is not moving as rapidly as they had anticipated. Uh, but the contract states they have till April of 2022 to finish that. Uh, the Kelsey Town Bridge is moving fa fairly um, speedily. And they, they are very pleased with the progress growing there. And um other than that they're in their spring uh mode where they're cleaning the streets and making sure that the fields are ready for uh the sports participants and they made mention of the dedication of the harry swan uh um gazebo whatever i'm sorry it's not a gazebo um and that that will be at 12 o'clock on Saturday, the dedication, and that um, everybody is encouraged to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Anybody else? All right, here and then, then we will move on to executive session. So we will need a motion to go into executive session to discuss real estate pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 1 206D and invite Carl and Mary. So moved. Second. Second. All favor? Aye. All right. Proposed abstain. Thank you. We are now back from executive session and we will move on to item number 16, which is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Stain, thank you all very much again. Have a great day. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.